Good morning, History 111, Sections 1 through 12. This is your professor, Mark Smith. And today we are going to be discussing Revolutions in Time and Space. This is the lecture for Monday, March the 23rd, Lecture 14. But before we get going, uh, a couple of announcements. First and most importantly, I hope you're all well and staying safe. And secondly, I would direct your attention to the revised syllabus that has been posted on Blackboard. It's imperative that you look at this syllabus in some detail because everything is now transitioning to online teaching, as you know. And the revised syllabus explains how the contents folder for the audio lectures works, how the discussion sections will work beginning March 23rd, how your submission of your transcriptions will work, and of course some detailed information on how we will conduct the second examination on March the 30th. That examination will be online and I've provided details in the revised syllabus. So please make sure that you look at those and follow the details with some care because it's important that your hard work is rewarded but you're going to have to use this new delivery system, this new platform, in order for us to grade you and for you to be fully engaged with this course. So it's been a while since I saw you, and I want to remind you where we are in this course. Last time we looked at Jeffersonianism and the activities of Thomas Jefferson, as well as the uh, following Republicans, the Democratic Republicans, who essentially established a preeminent one-party system in the first 25 years of the 19th century. And today we follow on that conversation by looking at what I've called revolutions in time and space. The terms and the overheads are in your contents folder and I would recommend that you look at those before we get going. And you'll see that I've divided the lecture into two sections. The first section is the market revolution, and the second is called promoting exercise. And this lecture essentially details what are known as internal improvements, which incorporates the transportation revolution, things such as canals and roads and railroads, and I'll be taking you through why that was important. Um, we'll also be looking at the new nationalism and economic nationalism sponsored by Henry Clay, John C. Calhoun and John Quincy Adams. And we'll also be considering some of the uh, legal infrastructure, the Supreme Court rulings in particular, that allowed for the promotion of enterprise in this period and that had a long and important legacy underwriting American economic development in the 19th century. And you'll see that there are three overheads also attached to that content file that includes the terms, the critical terms we'll be using, and I'll refer to those overheads as I go through the lecture today. So I want to begin this lecture with a question and the question is quite simple. If I told you I wanted to drive from Columbia, South Carolina to Charleston, South Carolina, and I asked you how far that is, I'd be interested in your answer. Some of you might say it's, what, 200 miles, and others might say it's almost two hours. The way that you answer that question tells you a great deal about the subject of today's lecture. If you answered it's almost two hours, you gave me an answer that is a product of the developments that I'm going to describe today. Because I didn't ask how long it took, I asked you how far it is. And if you said two hours, what you're really saying is that space is reduced to time. The distance, 120 miles, 
is space. The time, two hours. What I would suggest is that the, the developments that I'm going to describe today led us into a mentality that reduced space to time so that increasingly when people ask how far something is, they didn't tell you in terms of miles, they told you in terms of time. And this is broadly known as the market revolution. A revolution in markets, in the transportation of goods, people, ideas. And I think fundamental to this market revolution is this collapsing of space and time. So let's begin with the market revolution itself. I think it's fair to say that a truly national system of markets began to grow following the War of 1812. And it's during this period, after the War of 1812, that the United States enters a period of sustained and impressive economic growth. Now, before the war, U.S. commercial areas had been tied almost exclusively to international markets, and that was the legacy of mercantilism, if you recall. In other words, what they're doing is exporting. They're exporting cotton and tobacco, wheat and timber, and they're doing that with an eye to the East and the West. That is to say, they're exporting them to Europe and to other places. Of course, the problem with this export-oriented economy is that if other nations who bought these commodities suffered economic dislocation, so too did the United States. And furthermore, because so many Americans remained autarkic, if you recall, that means self-sufficient, they couldn't really absorb in sufficient numbers and quantity any manufacturing that the United States made itself. But the War of 1812 and the policies ironically pursued under Jeffersonianism changed this. They created an expanding domestic market. If you remember, we discussed Jefferson's unwitting sponsorship of the Embargo Act of 1807, and that had the ironic effect for such an agrarian of stimulating production in manufacturing, especially textile manufacturing. And the end of this war allowed pent-up European capital to flock back, flood back to the United States and stimulate nascent industrialization. Now, I want to be very clear about this. We're not talking about the scale or intensity of industrialization that we see after the Civil War, that is the principal economic platform um, when America really industrializes, but we're seeing the beginnings of American industrialization in this period between about 1815 and 1860. So central to this market revolution was um, a series of what were known as internal improvements. And these internal improvements combined into what is known as the transport revolution. Before the transport revolution, which started principally in the 1820s, uh, trade in the United States was limited to the coast mainly where it connected with international markets, as I say. But after the 1820s, after the War of 1812, international trade, while it remained important, became increasingly internal too. That is to say, America became very much a domestic market as well as an international market. So, for example, between 1825 and 1855, the cost of transportation on land in the United States fell by 50%, while its speed increased fivefold. So, if we think about this, between 1825 and 1855, the cost of transportation on land in the United States fell by half, while its speed increased by a factor of five. And the net effect of that was to draw new regions within the United States into an increasingly national market. So let's have a closer look at this transportation revolution that formed the basis of the market revolution, because you can't understand the market revolution unless you understand the transportation revolution. And I'll direct your attention here to Overhead 1, which details the principal roads and waterways around 1840 in the United States. 
and the canals are indicated with a dotted line, a primary road is a red line, and the secondary road is a uh, orange line. So the canals, the most famous and the one that helped stimulate and um, accelerate canal building generally was the Erie Canal, and that was built between 1818 and 1825. And it stretched from Albany on the Hudson River to Buffalo on Lake Erie in New York. It measured a total of 364 miles. This was an impressive feat of engineering, conducted mostly by immigrant workers who labored intensely and for long periods of time clearing forests, removing stumps and digging. This was an enormous undertaking. The hard work paid off economically. The Erie Canal reduced the cost of shipping a ton of goods from Buffalo to New York City from more than 19 cents a mile to less than 3 cents a mile within a few years of its completion. By 1860 the cost had fallen to less than 1 cent a mile. So before the Erie Canal, in other words, it cost you 19 cents a mile to transport some goods. By 1860, it was less than one cent a mile. The canal also stimulated ancillary growth. For example, towns sprang up alongside the Erie Canal, for example, Rochester. And the Erie Canal also inspired other states to build their own canals in an effort not to lose commerce to the state of New York. By 1840, the United States had completed about 3,300 miles of canals, 3,300 miles of canals by 1840, uh, at about a cost of 125 million. Interestingly, half of that cost of $125 million came from state governments, and the other half came principally from private investment. There was another dimension to this uh, riparian or uh, river or waterborne transportation. And the first was the canals and the second was steamboats. The first successful steamboat or experiment with a steamboat uh, was in 1807. And Americans, particularly those living along the Mississippi River, the great tributary that allows access to the very guts and the heartland of the United States, uh, started to experiment with steamboats and increasingly used them as a way to get goods and people virtually the entire length of the country using the Mississippi. So steamboats reduced a trip from New Orleans to Louisville in Kentucky from 90 days to eight days. And this was very important um, the steamboat essentially allowed you to traverse upstream, that is to say, to go against the stream. That's why it took so long before the steamboat, 90 days, to get from New Orleans to Louisville. And that's why it only took eight days uh, after the uh, propagation and use of steamboat um, on the Mississippi. They're flat-bottomed, they could go o over unnavigable sections of rivers, and they could haul very heavy loads even when the river was low. So that's your riparian or your waterborne transportation canals and steamboats. Roads are also important. Um, they do become macadamized and hardened and uh, traversable. Uh, there was some experimentation with things called plank roads, which were a kind of wooden road. Um, to increase speed. But these roads weren't what we would recognize today as uh, wholly reliable. Um, they were often little more than tracks, uh, especially in the secondary roads. But these national roads um, did become important for uh, horse-drawn commerce and um, the, the connection of people uh, from point A to point B. The most famous probably would be the National, National Ro Nashville Road. Uh, you can see it on the map, which eventually connected Memphis to Washington, D.C. I would suggest, though, that the most important, the single most important um, form of transportation that underwrote the market revolution was the railroad. And you can see 
the extent of railroad development in the United States to 1860 on your second overhead. In 1830, the nation had a total of 13 miles of railroad track. 13 miles of railroad track in 1830. Ten years later, by 1840, the railroad track measured about 3,330 miles. It's almost the exact same length as the canals. By 1850, the nation had 8,800 miles of track. This is a, a, a stunning and impressive deployment of engineering, labor, and the increase in the mileage of railroad track is really quite breathtaking um, within about 20 years from 13 miles in 1830 to 8,800 miles in 1850. And it's important to remember that the, the railroads were qualitatively different. Um, they were largely independent of weather and they were for the time the fastest of all forms of transportation. Uh, in fact, they were considered to be so fast, um, even though by our standards these would be slow, um, averaging about 20 miles an hour, 25 miles an hour, although they did increase in speed during the antebellum period, but they were considered to be so fast that people initially, when they first started traveling on railroads, worried that they would suffocate, that the speed was so great that the breath would be taken from them, stolen by the very speed of travel. But in due time, of course, Americans adapted to the railroad and used it to transport goods and people and information. Now, contrary to, to many southern stereotypes about the backwardness of the antebellum or Old South, um, it might interest you to know that railroads were really pioneered here in South Carolina. The Charleston Hamburg Railroad was finished in the mid 1830s and the Charleston Hamburg Railroad was at the time of its completion connecting Charleston and Hamburg uh, was the world's longest railroad line under single management and it was about 136 miles. Uh, obviously, this was in service to the cotton economy of South Carolina. It connected the interior of the state to the port of Charleston. And its length was such that it posed some initial problems. At the time of its completion, there was no such thing as time zones in the United States. Time zones in the United States did not become um, common or uh, established until the year 1883, long after the Civil War. But the length of the Charleston-Hamburg Railroad was such that uh, there was some difficulty in maintaining um, accurate counts of when trains were due to arrive and when they were supposed to, to uh, depart from each station. And so this was the first railroad to impose a local standard time. All time at the time was local time. That is to say, there were several minutes difference between, say, Charleston and Somerville, and Somerville and Columbia, and Columbia and Hamburg. And these, this local sun-driven time caused some complications. So all the Charleston and Hamburg Railroad did was establish standard time at six of its stations. And that kind of established a a synchronicity that had been missing before. In other words, the railroad was technologically very advanced, ahead of its time, and it was pioneered and established in South Carolina. By the 1850s, the railroads became the dominant form of transportation in this country. So you might ask, what is the effect of this market revolution, this transportation revolution, these internal improvements, and I think there are several. Uh, the first is manifest in agriculture. The transport and market revolutions linked the self-sufficient farming families we've seen uh, to the national market. Before the transportation revolution, for example, wheat uh, 
uh, could be shipped at a profit no farther than 50 miles. In other words, the cost of transport was higher than profit from that particular commodity. But given the new and available cheap transportation previously isolated and self-sufficient farmers, folks who had farmed just for themselves, now began to grow goods and wheat, for example, not just for their own consumption, but for sale and profit. And this drew them into not just a national market, but increasingly an international market. And instead of just bartering or trading, these formerly remote and isolated self-sufficient farmers became increasingly reliant on cash, on banks, on merchants, because they needed a credit. And in a way, this started to connect people to the, the nearest towns, which in turn connected them to the nearest cities, which in turn connected them to the nearest markets. The other impact on agriculture, in addition to drawing out these self-sufficient farmers and connecting them to the market um, and making them a part of the market, the other impact on agriculture was in regional specialization. So the impact of this market revolution uh, lent each area of the United States an increase, increasingly specialized agricultural function. Uh, the South increasingly concentrated on staples for export, both internationally and to the North, most obviously cotton, and we'll talk about that more in a couple of lectures time. The West grew increasingly foodstuffs, especially grain, such as uh, wheat and Places like Wisconsin and Illinois became major wheat producing states by 1850. What did they do with this wheat? They exported it to the south, which was increasingly growing cotton, and to the north. What was the north doing? Well, the north really couldn't compete with wheat yields from the fertile western lands. Um, so they shifted to fruit, produ fruit production, veg vegetables, dairy, and increasingly manufacturing. So what we have here is a regional specialization. The South is producing cotton, which they export to Europe and to the North. The West is producing foodstuffs, especially wheat. And the East, while producing some foodstuffs, is increasingly um, engaged in industrial manufacturing um, which in turn knits together the United States economy. This is, becomes an interdependent economy through regional specialization. So for the first time, really, um, America started to look inside rather than outside. Certainly there was international trade still, and that would always be the case. But really for the first time, these regions and states began to work within the United States to establish its own domestic economy. Now, it wasn't just uh, foodstuffs and cotton and textiles that were affected by this transportation and market revolution. People were too, and so was information. And in fact, you could make the case that integral to the growth of the national market was the spread and communication of information. This was facilitated by the railroads, and by canals, and by roads, by steamboats, but especially through the Postal Service. Immediately after the American Revolution, the Postal Service blossomed as a handmaiden to growth of marks and trans markets and transportation. And in fact, the Postal Service was very quick to recognize the speed and efficiency of the railroads and came to contract with them um, as well as stagecoach lines to carry mail. And if you read some of the stipulations of these contracts between the United States Postal Service and these local railroads, you'll be stunned to see that uh, they demanded delivery measured not in um, precision of hours, but precisions of minutes. They wanted to be able to guarantee the delivery of mail uh, within um, the measurement of minutes. 
So this is a very precise, very organized system for conveying information. Because the United States government subsidized the postal system, it was affordable, and so it assisted in the widespread and relatively efficient dissemination of information. By 1828, as early as 1828, there were twice as many post offices in the United States as there were in the United Kingdom. So it's a critical part of the market revolution. If you want a visual summary of everything I've said so far, I would ask you to look at overhead number three. And overhead number three really summarizes the combined effect of this internal improvements, uh, the market revolution, everything I've just described. Because what it shows you is that even though the United States between 1800 and 1850 is growing physically. You can see that in 1800, the United States essentially ends at the Mississippi River. And by 1857, the country has sprawled all the way to the West Coast. Even though it's getting larger, the time that it takes to get from A to B is much shorter. So, for example, if you look at overhead three, you can see that uh, to get to from New York to New Orleans in 1800 takes you about four weeks. By 1857, courtesy of the impact of the railroads, steamboats, roads, um, shipping, the time that it takes to get from New York to New Orleans is about six days. It's a remarkable revolution insofar as it reduces space to time. And this is why, for those folks who answered the question, how far is it from Columbia, South Carolina, to Charleston, South Carolina, for those folks who answered about two hours, that is the legacy of the market revolution. Let me turn to the second part of the lecture, and this has to do with promoting enterprise. Now, the market revolution um, was helped by both federal government and the judiciary. Uh, let me look at the federal government's impact and shaping of the market revolution first, and then we turn to the legal underwriting of the market revolution. So after the War of 1812, um, leadership really passes to a new generation in the Republic. These were younger men who were ardent nationalists. They believe in national destiny, the, the national uh, right and trajectory of the new United States. And among them, um, of the, well, among these new nationalists were Henry Clay, John C. Calhoun, and John Quincy Adams. And we're going to come across Clay, Calhoun, and Adams again quite soon. And it might surprise you in particular that Calhoun was uh, initially a nationalist, which he was. He becomes a, a state's writer later. But for the moment, uh, Clay, Calhoun, and Adams in particular were the people who championed the uh, market revolution and used the resources and power of the federal government to help establish and disseminate the market revolution. So they became leaders of the um, Republican Party, and they advocated a policy known as New Nationalism. And the New Nationalism simply was a set of economic policies designed to foster prosperity in all regions of the country. And that was important. It was supposed to be evenly spread between the West and the Northeast and the South. And it was designed to bind these regions together into a powerful economic republic. So the idea of new nationalism is to um, use the authority and power of the federal government to promote certain economic policies across the country that would then bind these various regions together to form an economic bloc that would then be in service to a larger national concern about economic power, economic independence. And even somebody like Madison, um, who was naturally quite leery of... Uh, uh, federal sponsorship of economic growth, saw the need for increased federal activity. Um, for example, when the Charter of the First National Bank expired in 1811, 
uh, the country's finances became destabilized, and although Madison had initially opposed Hamilton's early measures to establish the National Bank, he in fact agreed to the chartering of the Second Bank of the United States in 1816. And please remember that date, 1816, when Madison agrees to the chartering of the Second Bank of the United States, because this is going to become important when we look at what happens under Andrew Jackson in the 1830s. But my point here is very simple, that even Madison recognizes the importance of a federal financial system that will underwrite economic growth. And in fact, he recognizes that its absence might be deleterious or quite dangerous. Madison also agrees to a mildly protective tariff, very much along Hamiltonian lines, in an effort to help American industry. Um, what he's doing here in 1816 um, what Madison is doing here in 1816 is trying to protect a nascent American manufacturing base by using tariffs. This is a very Hamiltonian policy, but Madison recognizes that times have changed and that the federal government is in fact obliged to help um, uh, trigger and inspire uh, economic and industrial growth. He also recommends that the government promoted uh, internal improvements, and although this period witnessed a lot of Jeffersonianism, I think that it had heavy elements of Hamiltonian federalism. So the federal government was important for establishing and helping promote uh, the market revolution, for, uh, for expanding through space and reducing space to time. The judiciary, the legal branch of the United States, uh, was in fact quite critical to the market revolution. And in fact, I would say more important than presidential and con congressional initiatives uh, was the behavior of the Supreme Court in this period for promoting uh, the market revolution. And the Supreme Court in this period is under the leadership of Chief Justice John Marshall, and he presides over the court for a very long period of time, from 1801 to 1835. And he manages to convince his colleagues on the Supreme Court that the court should uphold the sanctity of private property and the power of the federal government to promote economic growth. And he does so through a series of landmark cases. And all of these cases um, are based on Marbury versus Madison of 1803. And you will recall Marbury versus Madison from my lecture on Jeffersonianism. Uh, if you don't recall it, let me refresh your memory. Marbury versus Madison was a simple but critically important case, which essentially established the supremacy of the Supreme Court. Um, it, it made it the ultimate arbiter of what was in fact legal. So all these other cases that I'm going to list in just a moment um, were based on Marbury versus Madison. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to identify a handful of critical cases ruled upon by the Supreme Court, all of which in various ways help promote the market revolution. And the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to give you the name of the case I'm going to tell you the significance of the case first, and then I'm going to explain the basis of the case. Okay, so I'll tell you the case name, I'll explain the significance of the case, and then I'll unpack it for you and give you some details that will help you understand why the case uh, came to be and why it was ruled upon in, in the way that it was. So the first case, um, and again, refer to the, uh, uh, the lecture outline, um, that's in, in the contents on Blackboard. The first case was known as McCulloch versus Maryland. And this is the case um, that was passed in 1819 or ruled upon in 1819. And in this case, um, the Supreme Court, the significance of the case, the Supreme Court upholds the constitutionality of the Second Bank of the United States. So McCulloch versus Maryland of 1819, its significance is that the Supreme Court upholds the constitutionality of the Second Bank of the United States. 
the basis of the case uh, was this. Um, Maryland had levied a tax on the Baltimore branch of the National Bank, and the bank refused to pay the tax. Because the Bank of Baltimore refused to pay the tax uh, levied upon it by the state of Maryland, the case went to the Supreme Court. And as is the nature of Supreme Court um, deliberations, the very constitutionality of the bank in this case was called into question by the state of Maryland. So Maryland said, look, uh, the Baltimore branch of the National Bank is refusing to pay this tax that the state of Maryland wants to levy. And we call into question the very constitutionality of the Bank of the United States. In response to this, Chief Justice Marshall, not unlike Hamilton would have argued, uh, called for a loose interpretation of the Constitution. And he argued that the bank was in fact constitutional because it helped Congress and the country maintain public credit. He says it's, it's necessary to the public good. And what you have here um, is a very powerful statement about the constitutionality of the National Bank and, in turn, the ability of the bank to help underwrite the financial underpinnings of the market revolution. So that is McCulloch versus Maryland of 1819. Terribly important case for establishing the financial uh, oil that will help provide internal improvements, the transportation revolution and the market revolution. A second case is known as Gibbons versus Ogden, and this case is heard by the Supreme Court and ruled upon by the Supreme Court in 1824. So the significance of Gibbons versus Ogden um, is very simple. Here the Supreme Court encourages commerce by establishing the federal government's right to regulate interstate commerce. I'll say that again. The significance of Gibbons v. Ogden of 1824 is that the Supreme Court encourages commerce by establishing the federal government's right to regulate commerce between the states and among the states. So the basis for this um, court ruling, essentially the case originated in New York, New York State. And under New York state law, a man named Aaron Ogden held a monopoly on steamboat traffic on the Hudson River. And as you know, the Hudson River connects New Jersey and New York City. So Aaron Ogden has a state mandate from the state of New York that allows him to have uh, a monopoly on steamboat traffic connecting New Jersey and New York City. Aaron Ogden was obviously very happy to have this monopoly. Okay, he was the only person allowed by the state of New York to traffic between New Jersey and New York City. Now, Thomas Gibbons also had a license to operate a steamboat, um, and he set up a competing line with Ogden. Now, his license was a federal license. So Thomas Gibson's has a, has a f Gibbons sorry, has a federal license to operate a steamboat between New Jersey and New York City, just like Ogden did. And so he sets up this competing steamboat line and Ogden sues. This case makes its way to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court under Marshall strikes down the monopoly granted by the state of New York. He strikes down Ogden's monopoly. And instead, the Supreme Court establishes the federal government's right to regulate commerce. What's really going on here is that the Supreme Court is saying, look, Ogden's monopoly that's granted by the state of New York is secondary and inferior to the federal license granted to Thomas Gibbons. It is only the federal government's right to regulate commerce between states. And because these, this, this steamboat traffic was connecting New York and New Jersey, it is the opinion of the Supreme Court that only the federal government has the right to 
regulate that commerce. And according to economic historians, this ruling increases economic competition considerably by taking away monopoly rights from the states. So under federal authority, um, there is there is no monopoly right for a state to establish commerce. All interstate commerce can only be granted uh, by the federal government. And that apparently uh, has significant impact on the way that commerce flourishes and grows um, following this case. The last case I want to identify and talk about is known as Fletcher versus Peck. Fletcher versus Peck. And this is an earlier case. This is from 1810. And again, I'll give you the significance first, and then I'll tell you the basis of it. So the significance of Fletcher versus Peck of 1810 uh, is very simple. Here you have the Supreme Court of the United States defining the nature of contract law. And it shows how far the Supreme Court is willing to go to protect private property. This really is a case about private property and contract law. And it establishes uh, private property as kind of sacrosanct and largely independent of um, political shenanigans. So it causes people to feel secure in making contracts and their own private property. This will become clear when I tell you something of the basis of this, this Supreme Court ruling, Fletcher versus Peck of 1810. So the basis is that the Supreme Court here is really striking down a state law from Georgia. And they are striking down a Georgia law um, taking back a land grant from a group of speculators um, that had been obtained by bribing members of the state legislature. So don't worry too much about these details here. But really what's going on is that Marshall and the Supreme Court, they're arguing that if a state uh, makes a contract with um, a group of individuals, the state doesn't have the legal right to rescind that contract once it has been made. So in other words, what Georgia is trying to do, they agreed to a deal, they agreed to a la land grant, and then they tried to rescind. They tried to uh, take it back um, once there had been exposed some issues with that grant. But the Supreme Court is saying you can't do that as a state. Once that grant has been made, the state has to abide by its own provisions. And what's really happening here is that private property is being made sacrosanct. That private property matters more than state legislation, or at least once that legislation has been passed. And this is terribly important because it allows people to engage in commerce with the full faith and belief that their private property will be protected from perhaps the caprice of state rulings. After all, state general assemblies change all the time, and just because they want to change their mind doesn't mean they should be able to change your property. That's essentially the point of this case. And combined, all of these cases, as well as many others, have a huge impact on American economic development and uh, financial development. Because essentially the Marshall Court, the Supreme Court in this period, is really engaging in encouraging economic risk-taking. They're protecting contracts and property, they're limiting state interference in business, and they're creating a climate of business confidence that uh, proves essential to the creation of a national market with the federal government able to regulate interstate commerce. So that's our conversation about revolutions in time and space. And in our next lecture, we'll look at the age of Jackson. Until then, stay safe, and I'll talk to you soon.